Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to HDK on this beautiful, fresh winter's morning. Later, we hear the gospel reading for today, which contains the feeding of the 5,000. So as we gather here today, let us feed on the bread of life, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the word and the sacrament that he shares with us today. So a special welcome to all of those who are joining us this morning for our worship online. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you today to give you our praise and thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, for the mighty and wonderful God that you are, who looks upon us with love and grace and mercy and favour. So, Lord, feed us this day as we gather here as your children, children of the King. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, have a, a time of worship led this morning by Deb and Lara. <laughs>
secret stash this morning sometimes I don't know about you but sometimes in church I just get a bit hungry and I think oh, especially during the sermon oh, I might have something to eat hey <laughs> cheap shot oh yeah but when you're the wife you can have as many cheap shots as you like actually I probably shouldn't eat chips because he'll know because he'll hear it won't he so do you think maybe I shouldn't eat chips what do you think? Yeah, stuff on lollies. Oh, uh-huh. I haven't got any lollies. Anybody got any lollies? Oh, you have. So I've got a bit of stuff in here. I've got some chips. I pinched some of Gary's almonds. But now that I look around, I think I should probably share it. Does anybody want some of my chips and nuts? Oh, I haven't got enough. Like, you could probably have a little bite. I will give you half an almond. Would that do? You don't want half an almond? I, I would take the first bite. You can have the second bite. Oh, COVID. Oh, I can't do that. Sorry. So I haven't got enough in here. Oh, put it away. I'll just put it away. I just put it away. Okay. Kind of reminds me about a story in the Bible that goes a little bit like this. I might make up bits and pieces as I go, but I'll do my best. So one day... Jesus and the disciples had been super busy 
and they'd been teaching and healing and doing all sorts of stuff. And you know what? They were just really tired. So they got on a boat and they went across the lake and they thought they'd be able to have a rest when they got to the other side of the lake. Do you know what happened? You know what happened? Do you think they got to have a rest? There were lots of people. They heard that Jesus was going to be there. And he looked at the people and he loved them. And so he sat down on the grass and he taught them and he did all sorts of wonderful things, even though he was really tired. And it was getting late. And the disciples said to him, there's lots of people here. Like the Bible says, there were 5,000 men. So when you add in the women and the kids, there's a lot more than 5,000 people there. There was a huge crowd. And the disciples are going, Jesus, it's getting really late. We need to feed these people or they need to go away and get some food. And Jesus said, well, you feed them. <gasps> what am I going to feed them with? Where am I going to get food to feed this many people? I mean, I didn't have enough there to share with everybody here. And, like, I've got these snacks, but there's nothing I can do to make that much food feed everybody here. And then there was a little boy in the crowd and he had five pieces of bread and two fish. You know the story, don't you? And so the disciples gave that to Jesus and they said, well, here you go. Like, this is what we've got. And so Jesus blessed that food and he said to the disciples, go and give it to them. Well, I would have thought he was a bit crazy, really, thinking that that much food would feed that many people. Don't you think that's a bit crazy? I think that's a bit crazy. But there's nothing I can do to make these snacks feed this many people. But all those people were filled with food. They had as much as they needed. But wait, there's more. There were 12 baskets of leftovers from five pieces of bread and two fish fed a huge crowd with 12 baskets of leftovers. That's amazing. I can't do that. Indy, you can't do that. No, oh, Jimmy, you can't do that. Not even mum and dad can do that. Not even him over there can do that. But Jesus could do it. And, you know, whatever we've got, we've got a little bit of time we have got a little bit of love to give, all of those things. We give them to God and he turns what we've got into amazing things. Our little bit of love could make a lot of difference in a person's life. So whatever you've got, you give it to God and he'll bless us. Okay, should we pray? Jesus, thank you that there was that little boy in the crowd that gave his food that you are able to bless and give back to the people. Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread of life. That while you might not give us bread, you give us yourself. Father, we thank you that Jesus came for us, that we may have eternal life because he is our bread of life. Amen. So let's stand for the greeting of peace. So the Lord be with you. We are the body of Christ. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. So let's share the peace with each other. Okay, you may be seated as we hear the gospel reading for this morning. Thank you, Norm. The Gospel reading this morning comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21, and it's on page 1055 of the Pew Bible. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples the Jewish Passover feast was near. 
When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for we already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough food for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fishes, but how far will they go among so many people? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is, co is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus was not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, Lord Jesus Christ. This morning I'd like to share with you a message on the basis of the uh, first 15 verses of our gospel reading, the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you to acknowledge you as God and King. We ask you to come to us now and feed us with the bread of your word, to grow us and bless us in a real and true relationship with you as we live our earthly lives on our heavenly pilgrimage. In your precious name we pray, dear Lord. Amen. As I was thinking about an illustration for the opening of this sermon this morning, I remembered an old game show that used to be on TV when I was a child. Now, I can't remember the name of the game show, but I remember how it went. Maybe some of you can remember the name of this game show. It was hosted by Don Seckham, and it was on uh, QDQ Brisbane Channel 9 back in the way old days. And it wasn't I've got a secret, I remember I've got a secret, but it was something else where there were people, three people sitting at a, a table and the panel, which often included the uh, quintessential Joy Chambers and Babette Stevens, would ask the contestants questions to try and identify who they really were. And at the end of the panel asking the, the questions, they would guess who the real uh, Harry Smith or Jane Brown was. And Don Seckham would ask the, the contestants a question, would the real Harry Smith please stand up? And there'd be a lot of <coughs> scraping to and from with chairs and looking at each other and people half getting up and sitting down until the end, the real Harry Smith would stand up. Now. Can you tell me that name? Nobody from the first service could remember. They remember the game, but they don't remember what it was called. Some looked up on the Google, and I did too, but I couldn't find what it was. But anyway, it's not really important. What I want you to remember is the format of that game show and how it went with one real contestant and two imposters who could have been the real deal but they weren't. As we take for our theme this morning, you need the real Jesus. 
Now, our text begins with Jesus and his disciples on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. They were in Gentile, non-Jew territory. A great crowd of people had followed Jesus there. Why? Because they had seen the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. So far in John's Gospel, it's written about Jesus healing the official son, recorded in John 4 and also the account of the man at the pool of Bethesda who was been a cripple, but Jesus healed him after 38 years. So Jesus had done these two miracles and no doubt many, many more miracles of healing. Now, in a day when the practice of medicine was extremely primitive, life expectancy was lower. A lot of the population died at a younger age than today, but that doesn't mean that there weren't plenty of people who lived until their 70s or 80s. So here is this healer, Jesus, and he lays hands on people, and they are healed completely, everyone, every time. And such a person would indeed attract a great following in those days. Free medical, guaranteed to work every time. Now, who wouldn't be in that? I think he'd even get a large crowd following him today, wouldn't he? In my previous parish in Westport, New Zealand, between all of the churches, we probably had about 300 people in church on a Sunday. Yet, if there was some psychic coming to town or some channel of messages from the dead, the local community theatre would be packed out with 500 people or more in standing room only every time. People aren't too fussy about the source of spiritual power and the miraculous as long as it seems to work. Now, Jesus' spiritual power, which was completely different from this uh, alternate source of power that I've been speaking about, his spiritual power certainly worked. And this large crowd followed him. And Jesus went up in the mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. He was taking on the posture of a teacher, if we remember back to the Sermon on the Mount. In Mediterranean culture, areas outside of towns and villages were considered chaotic and uncontrolled by humans. In fact, they were often seen as places where demonic spirits and, and demons lived. Meals did not normally take place in these remote places. People didn't normally picnic, or go swimming or mountain climbing in these remote places in first century Mediterranean world. Also, John tells us the Jewish Passover feast was near. Many of the crowd would have been Jews. It was soon time for them to head off to Jerusalem as the Passover was one of the three Jewish festivals that the uh, Jewish people were obliged to attend each year. But in taking note that it was the time of the Passover festival, we need to remember the nature of the Passover meal, that it was of a whole roasted lamb and unleavened bread. Now there was a problem. A great crowd, 5,000 men plus women and children, were following them, at least 20,000 mouths to feed. And Jesus tested Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? A reasonable, rational, logical question. And instead of answering the question, where, Philip answered with, how much? Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. A reasonable, rational, logical answer, even if it wasn't the answer to the question of where. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was there, and he followed on with, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? A reasonable, rational, logical answer. Instead of answering where, 
Andrew answered with, what? It was a grassed area. Jesus made the men, uh, that made the disciples to make the men and their families sit. Now remember, this is a dark, spiritually shadowy place. And Jesus took the loaves and fishes and gave thanks and gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people as much as they wanted. When everyone had had enough to eat so that nothing would be wasted, Jesus sent the disciples to gather up the leftovers and there were 12 baskets full. So where do you buy, where do you get bread to feed 20,000 people? Peter, Andrew, and all you other disciples. The answer is Jesus. But nothing is mentioned about the disciples' response. But there's actually something mentioned about the people's response. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus, who can read the hearts of people, knew by all their murmuring that they intended to come and make him king by force. So what is this prophet who is to come into the world that they are speaking about? Well, there was an expectation, according to Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, that one day there would be a prophet arise like Moses and the miracles of the Exodus would be performed again. The people thought that Jesus was not just a prophet, but the prophet, this prophet from Deuteronomy 18. And since the phrase who is to come into the world is also used, it refers to the promised Messiah. So it's natural that the people would want to make him king. Jewish expectation of the Messiah was varied, but it certainly included the hope of a political deliverer, one who would meet the needs of the people. And who better to have as king than this one who could provide free food and free medical? Back then, kings were not simply the equivalent of a, a president who has the rights of hereditary succession. Rather, kings had total control and responsibility over their subjects, and they were expected to take care of them and provide them with fertility, peace and abundance. Jesus sees the fickle nature of the crowd and he withdraws from them. He goes further into the mountain where they won't go looking for him. The problem was that they were trying to make him a king like all the other kings, a strong worldly figure who would lead them in their strong worldly agendas. What a cruisy life to have this guy as king who could feed us all every day with food that we don't have to work for. Later, when Jesus catches up with them, he tells them in John 6, 26, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. <clears throat> Jesus withdrew because the enthusiasm these people had is not for who he really is. And this is important for our day and our lives. People have great enthusiasm about Jesus, but the Jesus they're excited about can sometimes not be the real biblical Jesus. I want you to go back now and think of that game show again. And I want you to imagine four different types of Jesus as sitting at a table. The first Jesus is the Pentecostal Jesus. He's the Jesus who does signs and wonders, like the Jesus in John 6 2. He has a large crowd following him because he does all these miracles. It also happens that way in the Pentecostal churches today that emphasize the signs and wonders. They are churches that have a big following. They have big healing services, big miracle services, and they bring these healing evangelists out from America. 
Often their preachers promote a gospel that God just has a miracle in store for you and you need to pray for your breakthrough in order to get it. Signs and wonders and miracles and walking in the anointing are the emphases. Many Pentecostals and modern-day revivalists have a very low view of Jesus. And by that I mean that they emphasise what Jesus did. He did humanly and in the power of the Spirit. They say that Jesus emptied himself of everything except love when he became man, and the miracles he did were in the power of the Spirit. Therefore, Christians are human, and also filled with the same Holy Spirit, should expect and should be able to do these same miracles as the same Holy Spirit works through them as work through Jesus. Such a view downplays the divinity of Jesus. It exalts humanity, and it can leave people shattered if miracles, signs and wonders don't happen through them or to them. Jesus is so much more than a miracle worker. While sitting beside the Pentecostal Jesus is the progressive Jesus. Progressive Christianity is a modern day term for what is used to be called liberal Christianity. Progressive Christianity simply defined as Christianity that is governed by reason and sciences. A lot like Philip and Andrew in our text, who answering Jesus' question to draw out faith in them, answered him with logic and human reason. A liberal view of the feeding of the 5,000 goes something like this. The miracle here was that everybody shared. Most of the people in the crowd had food and only the boys' food was mentioned. When Jesus took it and shared it with everybody, it encouraged all the people sitting in the crowd who had food to share it with others. You see, Jesus feeding 5,000 plus, plus, plus with five loaves and two fish is preposterous to the human rational mind. Modern man would never accept that. Like Pentecostals, progressives also have a low view of Jesus. They believe that Jesus isn't so much the divine son of God, but rather a moral example for us to follow. Jesus is more of a big brother who sets the pattern for us to walk in his footsteps Many progressive theologians deny the divinity of Jesus, the virgin birth, the physical resurrection, the miracles of Jesus, and anything supernatural in the scriptures. They call many of the stories of Jesus metaphor. Mark Sayers, author of the books Disappearing Church and Reappearing Church, says that the progressive vision of the world is the kingdom without the king, God's blessings without submitting to his loving rule, progress without his presence, justice without his justification, the horizontal implications of the gospel for society without the vertical reconciliation of sinners with God, our standard of moral purity without God's standard of personal holiness. While sitting next to the progressive Jesus is the prosperity Jesus. And why is he the prosperity Jesus? Because he is the free meal ticket, like the crowd in our text who wanted to make Jesus king because he would provide for all their needs. The prosperity Jesus arises out of the prosperity gospel. A reworked definition of the prosperity gospel from Collins English Dictionary says that the prosperity gospel is an idolatrous perversion of the gospel according to which Jesus is a means to God's full blessings, primarily of health, wealth and might, now available to those who trust and obey certain faith principles prescribed by a particular man of God. One of the key texts that the prosperity preachers use is 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that, his po- so that by his poverty you might become rich. Prosperity preachers interpret this to mean money. Paul doesn't mean that at all. It is to do with the Macedonian churches having a wealth of generosity, even though they are poor. From Galatians 3, 13 and 14, the words Christ redeemed us so that in Jesus Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles are also often quoted. Prosperity preachers will use these words to teach that God will give you the material blessings he promised to Abraham. If you actually read what Paul is saying there, the blessing of Abraham is the promise of the Holy Spirit. The prosperity gospel totally abuses God, Christ, and scriptures. And if we only want to follow Christ for what we can get out of him, if only we want bread when we want it, well, we too are abusers. So thinking of the game show, would the real Jesus please stand up? We need the real Jesus to please stand up. Who is this real Jesus? Well, the real Jesus is the one who withdrew again into the mountainside and he met the crowd later on the other side of the lake where he revealed to himself to them for who he really is. In John 36, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus didn't come into the world to lend his power to already existing appetites. He didn't come to be a miracle worker and have a big following. He didn't come to be the best possible example of humanity for people to follow. He didn't come to give everyone health, wealth and happiness. In doing this miracle and taking the five loaves and two fish and feeding 5,000 plus, he is opening the window as to who he really is. He is manifesting his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father from John 1.14. He is opening this window on his glory, not that we might get excited about how useful he might be in getting what we want, but that we might see that he himself is better than anything we ever wanted. The point of his making bread, as it were, out of nothing, like God making manna, is that the Son of God, fully divine, has come into the world as fully man, Jesus Christ, not to give you bread, but to be your bread. And since we're all sinners and do not deserve this bread, how will he give it to us? Well, in John 6, 51, he says, This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. When Jesus gives his flesh on the cross, he becomes bread, all nourishing, all satisfying bread for sinners who believe. And that bread gives eternal life. Not life that is just now in miraculous signs and wonders or in a good example to live by or in health, wealth and happiness. This is the bread of life that is really food that raises you up at the last day, that has eternal significance. This bread will sustain you in the times when that hoped for breakthrough miracle in your life doesn't occur, when you fail morally to live up to good human standards, when you don't have health, wealth and happiness, when life is tough, when you're fighting life in the trenches, when you're in that dark, spiritually shadowy place. Christ is your bread. Christ is your life in every situation. Christ is the real meal who sustains you into eternity. We all need the real Jesus. Amen. So, Lord, we, Jesus, we thank you that you are the real deal for us. We thank you that you are bread for our lives and for our earthly journeys and that you sustain us through all the ups and downs of life in who you are as truly God and truly man. Lord, bless and nourish us 
as we live our earthly pilgrimages until we indeed, through having eaten the bread that is your flesh, be raised up to eternal life on that last day. In your name and to your glory we pray. Amen. So I invite you now to stand and join with me in an affirmation of faith. I believe I need a shepherd because I am sometimes timid and other times overconfident because I often don't know the best path yet pretend I do because I rush into dead ends or lead others into hazardous places because my brightest ideas are seamed with darkness, because the things I crave may not be what is good for me. I need a shepherd. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. His wisdom leads me to the optimum opportunities. His word comforts me when I am anxious or afraid. His arm steadies me when I feel weary and heavy laden. His wounded body displays the cost of my rescue. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. I believe that I do not find him, but he finds me, that I am under his care by virtue of sheer grace. The love he gives me is to be shared with others, that he treasures my name and prepares a place for me, that his fold transfixes earth and heaven. I trust Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Amen. Jesus, you are the Lord, ruling heaven and earth. You take care of us. You give, give us everything we need. Sometimes we doubt and think we will not have enough. We worry about having enough clothes, food and a place to live. Help us to be thankful for all you give us. Give us trust. Or help us to trust in you, yeah. in the knowledge that you will always take care of us. Lord, in your mercy. We uphold our brothers and sisters into state at this time of lockdowns. Strengthen them to go through the mental battles and physical battles that are coming. We uphold our leaders and the medical teams and emergency workers at this time. Help us to focus on you, Jesus the bread of life. Strengthen us to take the message of Jesus and his glory out into the world. We uphold Tony Ham to you, Lord. We pray for his health, his family and the medical teams caring for him. I wonder who else needs your healing hand. I wonder what you are calling me to do this week. We 
we pray together the prayer you left us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who give us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So let's stand and say together the grace as we farewell our online viewers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And let us sing oceans.